you know, you know, they, they were the they were the ultimate garage punk band in the 60s. <laughs> Have a patriarchs in black uh i sure do shirt on i sure do my I buddy see. johnny kelly i know i'm gonna ask you about him in just a minute here okay. well, i guess we could well i guess we could start with that destroyer i mean let's let's get into it you uh the latest single video for destroyer obviously the great uh cover from the great kinks yeah um just one of those bands that you know i think a lot of people always overlook when they talk about vintage classic rock you know you know they, they were the they were the ultimate garage punk band in the 60s mm -hmm. you know and of course 70s they they did their thing and they they had some pop a lot of pop stuff going on but i i remember as a kid when i heard destroyer that was probably oh man 43 years ago for when that came out mm -hmm. 79 80 i mm -hmm. thought it, i thought it was amazing so mm -hmm. what happened was Cleopatra had asked us to, uh, they're like, you should do a duet with uh, Yerky uh, from the 69 Eyes. I'm mm. like, how, how did two guys do a duet, right? <laughs> so I'm like thinking of Tough. songs and I'm like, well, what can it be? And, and I said to Dan, I'm like, you know what? I got an idea. How about we do Destroyer from the Kinks and him and I can trade off. And we, and, and we also did... Um, on the CD, there's another cover song. There's Long Cool Woman by the Hollies. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we, we we did that with him as well. So it, you know, I, it was like, I got to pick, you know, I didn't know if one was going to come out and one didn't come out good, but I, I like them both. So, you know, yeah, I'm like, the hell, let's do it. I yeah, no, they came out. Blood on her fingernails by the way she kisses. Yeah, his voice is amazing <laughs> because you can get down really low like that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Man. Yeah, Long Cool Woman. Let's talk about that, too. Like you said the Hollies. I mean, that was, uh, I mean, just a staple of my childhood, man. My, I, that song was on my dad's mixed cassette tapes, like, <clears> left <throat> and right, man. I mean, did you guys, now, these are two UK bands from the 60s. Was this sort of a way to want to want to sort of, I guess, maybe pay a little homage to some of these older bands that no one really talks about much or, you know, I, I think, you know, especially for a band like the Hollies. Right. I mean, again, I, I look at it, you know, it's just whatever hits a nerve with me is what what really like is what I like. And mm -hmm. as Dan calls it, my ADD Supreme, it's like. <laughs> In order for me to get through a whole song, it's got to really hit a nerve. So that's exactly why I, I picked that song. Yeah. But you've you've liked that song for years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Since years. I was you always little, talked about it. Since I was a little kid, you know that song would come on the radio. It's just there's it's got some element to it that we don't find in music anymore, right? It's mm. that there's just nothing but hooks in it, and you know. It just it just catches you and keeps you. Yeah, it's a story song. He's telling a story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, and I, I did. I read actually that song was was kind of it was influenced by Green River by Credence. And if obviously if you listen to it, it's got a really similar vibe to it. Oh, wow. um, they were. Yeah. I, I just like researched and doing my thing for this. I actually uh, found that out. So <coughs> just a little a nugget. If you and it does similar, it sounds a little similar. So it's got that yeah that vibe. But um yeah, you, like you said, great song. It sticks in your head. Yeah, it doesn't leave it to you absolutely. So let's talk. Just going back to destroy real quick, guys. I mean, like you just kind of uh, talked about Steve. You know, you got uh, Johnny Kelly from you know the Mighty Typo Negative, obviously, and Patriarchs in Black. He's on drums there. You obviously you got the great Tommy Victor from Prong playing guitar. Two I know of your you know bandmates from from Danzig Dale. And of course, like you said, you got Yerky from the Sixty Nine Eyes. So, I mean, what was the reason, I guess, to, to get them all onto one song, maybe instead of kind of different ones? <clears throat> you know, I, I figured, okay, so we're going to have one guy on, on there from, from a pretty well-known, you know, European, whatever you want to call 69 Eyes metal. I don't know if they're really metal, but, the, you know, they have that interesting sound of that you know, metal goth, the whole thing. The but Helsinki I, Vampires. Yes. So I figured, you know what? Let's ask Tommy and, and Johnny if they'll do it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and they both obviously 
you know, really uh, enjoyed doing it. Uh, Tommy at the time had become a new dad. So just getting him to play, because at that point he hadn't even picked up a guitar for almost a year was during COVID. Mm. And uh, he wound up, um, you know, setting some stuff on just to just to get a, get us his tracks. And I was grateful that he did it. And, you know, Johnny, of course, is a, you know, one of my best friends and, uh, you know, would do anything for me as I would for him. So we were blessed to have both of them or all three of them at that point. So. Mm. Well, let's let's talk about the waiting. Uh, the new record, you guys' sophomore release, um, out now. Like you said on Cleopatra Records, um, yeah. definitely. You know, um, it's similar, obviously, to the first record, Love and Anger, uh, that came out back in 2016. But I mean, just to me, when I listen to it, I I, I think it's a, a bit more sort of aggressive and a little bit heavier um, than Love and Anger. Uh, to me, Love and Anger was really just a straight up good old rock and roll record. Uh, with a lot of punk influences, um, but to me, Waiting's just got a little bit, a little bit darker, a little heavier side to it. 
Um, was there anything particular you guys wanted to do differently on this record than than uh, Love and Anger? You know, I, I think for for me, I mean, <clears throat> it's an interesting way that Dan and I work, and it's like we get these ideas, we come down. If I if it's my idea, I hum it to him, and he has to take that and decipher what that hum is. Oh man! And and he's he's done real good with what's going on in my head. I can I. I can kind of hear the way it's supposed to be. I, I already know what the final thing is going to be in my head before we even start recording it. Okay. And he kind of figures that out and we, we kind of, and it meshes really well. Right. Cause there's no musical masturbation here. We're, mm. we're writing and playing for the song. A lot of times in the past where you get a lot of different members of a, of a band, they're not listening for the song. They're listening for their part. And mm-hmm. being that him and I are doing the whole thing, we're not listening for our part. We are the mm-hmm. parts. Mm-hmm. So we have to, you know, we have to listen to the song. And I think the difference between this and Love, Love and Anger is like, uh, this was more, uh, I think in my head, a different, a darker place. We were doing a lot of this recording during COVID. Uh, one of the songs, uh, there is a song on there. Actually, I believe it's The Waiting yeah, the 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 lead in the waiting was an interesting story, and I'll tell you why. Mm-hmm. As we were recording, um, Dan was trying to do the lead, and he kept he kept it was a challenge for him to do it, and he kept complaining about his arm. And I'm like, "Oh, come on, power through it!" You know, who knows what what he did. Wound up, he was in heart failure. So he. Yeah. He did finish the lead. I did. I did finish. And, but we, if, and we and you Facebook live that thing. Right. And, <laughs> and it, a few days later, he was in the hospital getting a quadruple Holy bypass. Shit. Yeah, wow. Like we, so so that oh, was an interesting time. Seven and a half hour surgery, quadruple bypass. Yeah. Wow, man. Are you, are you doing now, Dan? Everything okay? Yeah, no, I'm okay. Yeah. You know, it's uh, but it, it, I would say to anybody. It's it's not just it's not because I went to Hooters like once or twice a month. <laughs> like I had I had a very 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 stressful job, mm. very extremely stressful. I'm not going to go into it, but very extremely stressful. And stress accumulates in your body. Your body reacts to it as damage. Your body produces cholesterol to repair the damage. But there isn't if there isn't any physical damage there, it'll just build up. And just said so if you're feeling stress. Find some ways to get with it, you know, either candles, bubbling music, <laughs> walk, do some. Or the waiting. Or listen to the waiting, and I'm sure that'll help calm you down quite a bit. <laughs> oh, man. Wow. Well, I'm glad you're all right, Dan. I mean, that's quite the uh, way to find out, though, that you've, yes. you've yeah, obviously I'm, got I, that. I but... don't have any tattoos, but I'm a member of the Zipper Club. <laughs> oh man well like i said i'm glad glad you're okay man so let, i mean musically you guys you know once again you know when i listen to the way <laughs> you know i don't I, like i said it's not a metal or even a straight up punk record you know i, I was you know every time i listened to it, i was trying to figure out what would i i guess class of, or whatever you want to you know i wouldn't say you know label it, but what, what would be the closest thing to label your, your guys sound to me it's it's like a sort of a, I, I like to call it like sleaze rock you know it kind of got has like you know, it reminds me some of that like late '80s uh, sound that was coming out of the New York, New Jersey area, like Circus of Power. That that whole little, you know, um, that era. You know, between about '88 to about '91. Right. Um. But then again, you got songs like "Love of Hate of Pain," which I think is a great song, and that's you know that's more has more of a, I think a heavier punk influence on it, sort of like a Chelsea Smiles type of uh, a vibe to it. I mean, so would you guys now, like, I mean, just as you talked about before, Steve, when, you, you know, you hum something, Dan, you know, sits there, and I guess he works with that. But I mean, w- w- is that really how all these ideas start really with you yeah. just coming up straight with that? And then that's how it works? Really? Wow. Well, what we do is that, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a co-writing partnership. Like sometimes I'll sit in a lounge chair in my home studio bedroom and I'll have a guitar or a bass on while I'm just watching documentaries or whatever and i noodle around and i'll come up with a riff and much like he does i put the voice memo on it and then i'll bring it down and i'll bring down either if if it's a riff and then he he'll come down he said oh i have a song and sometimes we pull them together and then but what he talked about saying before he has when he has his idea 
he has it in his head mm-hmm. what he want what he hears and of course then i have to try and interpret it and figure out you know like when it comes to a certain like incidentals and things like that he goes well why don't you do this why don't you and then you okay all right we go and then and then it just builds up layer upon layer and but there's no intention like oh we want to we want to sound like this or we want to no, sound like that i i think you know it's kind of it, organic it's okay. you know I, it i think if you if you listen to the album the album is like a roller coaster and it, it takes you it's, it's here and, uh, uh, mm-hmm. and <laughs> it was on purpose for that again to keep my own attention for my own you know for our own songs i have to keep my own attention because i'm just like all over the place but mm. um Again, this it works, and our process works. There's no drama to be had. We have songs that didn't make it. You know, uh, there, you you know, you write songs, you record them, and you go, ah, I don't know. Maybe we'll revisit it. We have a lot of things to revisit, and I, you know, what the bad thing is, you know, owning our own studio here, um, it's good and bad. We do songs, and I just label them. New song. Yeah, new song. New song. Mm. New song. <laughs> so, you know, we, if I go look in, you know, on my hard drives, I have nothing but new songs. So I have to go by date and go back. And go, oh, remember this one? So, but for the most part, once we usually start a song, we just, we, we it, it'll take us a few days and we'll come back and forth and, and we'll just finish it and, and be done with it and put it to bed. It's just easier that way. Yeah. And I would say nine mm-hmm. times out of 10, like we started going and then it takes its own kind of shape. Mm-hmm. And then when we're done with it, we, we listen back to it. It's like, wow, that's that's a lot better than I thought it was. And, you know, you were saying, what what is, what is it that we sound like? As Dan said, I don't I don't know. Yeah, now, yeah. a lot mm-hmm. of people have said that I sound like Ian Asbury. Yes. Mm-hmm. I I don't hear it, but that that's just me. I mean, obviously, I I wouldn't I don't mind you know being in that company because Ian's a great vocalist. Uh, I don't hear it, but you know, I come from predominantly a punk rock background, so mm-hmm. my upbringings were my mom played fifties music. I got into Kiss and Elvis, and then punk rock. I skipped mm-hmm. the whole metal parts of where everybody was you know into metal. I was into punk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this was early on in the late seventies. Dan comes from a, more of a classic and a prog background, uh, mm-hmm. where he'll play a song that's a ten-minute song, and I'm like, "Please change this fucking yeah. thing." <laughs> Where's the chorus? You know. And mm-hmm. I, but I think when when we marry both ideas up, it it works because mm-hmm. he brings an element to my simplicity way of 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 writing and thinking because to me uh simple is better right because i i don't i don't really want to write tons of songs with all these chord changes because i love melody i love melodies and and harmonies and stuff and Mm -hmm. when you have all the changes there's no room to fit anything and then it becomes musical masturbation and i just don't like Mm -hmm. that that bores me so Mm -hmm. danzig taught me one thing he goes Whatever you write and whatever you put out, you're the one that has to be happy because at this point it lives on forever somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm the one that has to be happy. I'm the artist. And hopefully if it makes me happy, it'll make other people happy. Mm -hmm. Not Look, not everybody's going to like everything. That's why we have all different genres and all different bands and Mm -hmm. whatnot. And, and, uh, but uh, I think the reaction has been pretty good. Again, I think it takes you for a ride. And there's elements of pretty much everything in there. Yeah. Now I, I want to, cause you just said about how you, you know, having a, your own studio now, now you like simplicity. Dan likes a little more complex. Do you sit there? Do you guys sit there and kind of just, I mean, go out of each other's throats? Cause you know, in terms of how short, how long the song could be, especially when you got your own studio, right? You don't have any time constraints or nothing. Do you find it hard to like agree on finally, okay, this is enough. This is good. Or is there just a lot of reworking parts and so forth with the songs with you guys? There's, there's not a lot of that. In other words, once you get the basic foundation, the framework, you know, I tell them it's 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 like Bob Ross doing a painting. 
Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay, we're going to start out with this and we're going to do a basic rhythm track, maybe with some drums and we're going to add some bass and, you know, and then eventually it kind of takes on a, a life of its own. There's, you know, a couple of times in very early on, because when, from the last group that we had together, I was kind of like just the bass player and I wasn't really involved in the writing. I would come up with my parts and, you know, background vocals and stuff. So, uh, you know, I kind of I kind of felt like Dave Grohl and Nirvana, like I wasn't, you know, I wasn't utilized. This, but, but this is this is different. And I just said, OK, I'll play guitar because I, I can play guitar, but I don't mm -hmm. play guitar that anybody knew and came in. And he, of course, plays the drums and been playing for years. And in the beginning, when he'd sit there and he'd give me an idea, I'd be just like, OK. You know, and then build as you build up your confidence and you build up your repertoire and how we work together. Now it's this is an idea, that's an idea. We put them together, we work on them, and you know, it's none of this of like, well, that thing sucks. It's it's not. Mm -hmm. It's never that. Now we, we've we've never had that, and and again, it's not it's not one of those things where he'll go, well, that's not going to work. I think collectively, after we finish the song, we'll go, ah, that's okay. You know, and then we'll, mm -hmm. you know, maybe put it away. Like I said, just because we write and record a song doesn't mean we have to keep it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we're like you said, fortunately, <coughs> we don't, the, the time, you know, it, it, when you go to a studio and you have to pay for a studio, time is money and the money mm -hmm. is yours. So you have you have to have your shit together. Otherwise, you're spending and wasting time and writing songs in the studio. That's all well and good if you can afford that. Both uh, Dan and I have invested thousands upon thousands of dollars of gear, uh, world class gear, and um, you know the the only thing that's ours that we have is to waste is our own time. Mm -hmm. So it's it works out really good because I don't mind wasting time in the studio. It's my mm -hmm. place. I love it. Sure. But when we're down here, we we're working. We're not, you know, yeah. we're not just sitting around, you know, looking at our phones or doing no. whatever. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, you know, there's there's none of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah, well, time is still money, right? Even if if you own your own studio, it's still yeah. time. So yeah, exactly. So great. So, um, Steve, I'm going to go back to your vocals. Uh, I do hear Ian Asbury absolutely, but. It, it's not like it's just Ian Asprey. Like I said, it kind of fluctuates. It goes back and forth. You've got different styles the way you sing. Um, and, you know, um, so I guess to me, for your approach then vocally on the tracks, I mean, do you now, how, how do you approach it? Do you take it sort of, I guess, song by song? To, how do you, I guess, use your approach depending on how the style of the song is? Um, there's a lyrical content all. Does that drive any of the music that you hum out today in there? Talk about your approach then to the vocals. When I write vocals, <clears throat> actually, it's the harder it's the harder part of the actual writing process mm -hmm. because uh, I write the I write the, the melody before I write the words. Okay, right. So, mm -hmm. and that that's mm -hmm. everybody's different. Mm -hmm. But then it's like, <clears throat> excuse me. It, then it's like you know, it's the almighty subject. What are we writing about now? Look. I don't have the same anger as I did when I was 18 or 15. Uh, I'm angry about different things, but it's not just anger. There's mm -hmm. all kinds of things involved. There's everyday life. There's relationships, good or bad. There's hardships, good or bad. Uh, you know, and I say good or bad and hardships. There are good hardships. You know, there's shit that happens to you that winds up being a blessing in disguise and many for many reasons so i also look at hardships as sometimes they're really good things mm -hmm. so there's there's a little bit of everything in and how we approach it but i approach it from a melody standpoint first okay then we add to it okay yeah so like just when we're working on the things when it comes to a, a guitar part or a solo or something like that he's kind of like leading me to his vision and, and coaching and then when he does his vocal tracks i'll listen to because like i grew up in music departments and i played a bunch of different instruments and i sang in lots of choirs and all the rest of that kind of stuff so when i'm hearing his performance i'll be like that's really good 
maybe let's work on that. That one's better. You got a better one in you, that kind of thing. So, so as he coaches me on one thing, I kind of coach him on the other thing. And uh, cause sometimes when you're in the middle, when you're doing it and you're just thinking about doing it, you can't hear it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then, but, but he'll objectively hear it. And, but uh, you know, and that's like, like sometimes think this way. He'll just go, no, nah, no, nah. that's not it. It's not, but, it. but, but he's, he's a great vocal pr producer because Again, he knows how to get it out of me. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just, you, you know, I'm not hearing it because I'm singing it. So, mm -hmm. and in having that, his set of ears, again, because he's, you know, done choir and all that kind of stuff yeah. when he was younger, you know, you, you come from a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So it works. Sure. It, it works pretty well. I even sang barbershop in high school. Ah, oh, go. wow. In barbershop. Huh? Maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. Cover that. We need to yeah. do a metal barber. Yeah. Metal there barber. You go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I want to, you know, I want to get you, uh, you guys opinions on something, you know, just in general here, you know, I mean, as we know, you know, rock music, no longer very mainstream, you know. It, it obviously here in, in in the states. I mean, it's it's still a, a you know one of the top selling you know genres of music, but um, its impact really on the culture, just not just really. I wouldn't say I don't know if I'd say non-existent, but it's very minimal. I would say at this point, and it's kind of gone back underground. You know, it's a lot. I mean, just like a lot of musical genres over the years have, right? I mean, look at jazz, classical music, big band, all of it, right? All wanes in popularity and you know over time um so when i hear you guys do the covers of the kinks and the hollies it just it really kind of brings me back to the sort of roots of rock you know as we know it today and just and to me it's sad that it just doesn't really have that mass appeal that it once did but i also find that at the same time it being more underground really kind of keeps it a little more genuine and real in a lot of ways it doesn't get all watered down like things tend to do obviously when they go mainstream a few guys just, you know, I mean, you know, being in the music business for so long, I mean, especially, uh, you know, I know in the 80s there, Steve, when you were obviously, you know, with, with Sam Hain and, you know, just at the pinnacle really rock was at its popularity in terms of the effect on the culture. Do you guys feel, uh, do you think rock is better at the forefront, you know, where it once was alongside all the other genres like pop and so forth? Or do you like where it is today where it's still popular, but, you know, it's... On, in terms of the culture, it's sort of on the outskirts of society compared to when it was, you know, during its infancy. I mean, what's your take on that? So before I answer, before I give you my answer, wh where are you? Where do you live? Right now, I grew up in New York, but I live out in California, in the okay. San Francisco area. Oh, San yeah. Francisco, okay. Yeah. I go to L.A. a lot. Okay. And it's very interesting. When I go to L.A., they have so many rock stations that play songs like you would never hear over here on the, mm. in the New York tri-state oh, area. Yeah. Five Finger Death Punch and the, <coughs> the Cult and, and whoever, you, you mm. know, that rock band may be. They're playing stuff that's more, um, you know, not mainstream over here. You, I don't, I don't even think we have classic rock. Well, what's classic rock? Something from the mm. 2000s, right? Because mm -hmm. that's yeah. 23 years ago or 20 years ago. It's all programmed I, by, I, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's yeah. it's it's all pop and hip hop and, and mm -hmm. whatnot. Um, yeah. Now, do I do I think it's? I don't know if if what you're trying to say is rock dead. Is it just an underground thing? I don't think so. You know, I, I'm blessed with Danzig to be able to play a lot of these festivals, right? Mm -hmm. And like aftershock festival that we play mm -hmm. uh, up in Sacramento back Sacramento, in October. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You get 50,000 people there for three days to listen to rock bands. Mm -hmm. That's not showing you. It, it's not dead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we're, we're a product of, of what the financial people tell you what you're going to hear on the, on the, on the radio. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it limits our exposure to, everything else yeah it, we've we've made it we've made it the underground thing that it is and i and, and i don't even want to say underground because there's nothing underground anymore growing up and the punk rock scene that was underground mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. no you didn't have a chance in hell to get a song 
on the radio. Mm-hmm. I think it's different now. There was no internet radio back then. There, there was none of this, right? Mm-hmm. It was either mainstream or nothing. And you were being spoon fed in the 70s, 80s and 90s on what you were going to hear by because of the major labels. The great thing what punk rock did was that it established um, your big independent independent labels. Look at bands like The Offspring and Rancid, right? They set the tone for what became this bigger thing. It it brought that that newer punk rock. I'm not talking bands like The Ramones. Bands like The Ramones, which I grew up on, never got the shot that they really deserved. I'm sure mm-hmm. they inspired a lot of people. But so you took it out, and be, before you knew it, you know, the offspring they were on an independent label, and as was Rancid, they were on the same label, mm-hmm. and it blew up. And of course, the major labels I know they bought the offspring contract, and that continued their success for a while, and that brought it out to the mainstream. Then we, we had you know, their Nirvanas and whatnot, and then that. You know, hip hop was coming up really fast. You know, <clears throat> if we look at the early things like, um, you know, you had your run DMCs and NWAs and stuff like that. That remember, that was all independent at one point. Yes. And mm-hmm. that and, and because of the punk rock thing blowing up, I believe that really set the standard. And that's what really drove down your major labels. If you look at the label that we're on, Cleopatra, I mean, look, they're like the largest indie label in, in the country. Oh, yeah, they have thousands crazy. of titles, but it's not just metal or rock. I mean, they have everything. They have yeah. Engelbert mm-hmm. Humperdinck and um, mm-hmm. all kinds of people. Nancy Sinatra. Yeah, William, William Shatner. <laughs> like it's, William it runs the gamut. And the, but, staples, the staple singers. Right. So the, the great thing, Matt, is you know, while we, we deem it as underground, I think because, you know, at a time in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, new acts were a dime a dozen, right? Mm-hmm. Now they're a penny for 100. Mm-hmm. They're all over. By the by, the hit of the, the mouse, you're sending your music mm-hmm. to wherever through, whether it's through iTunes or whatever, you know, uh, uh, Spotify. A lot of people doing SoundCloud. Right. And, mm-hmm. and so you have your... You know, it's all at your fingertips. It's like, who can jump out though, right? Who has the money to jump out to have some mm-hmm. staying power? We've seen it with all kinds of bands, whether it's rock, whether it's pop, or whatever you want to call it. You look at bands like Foster the People or whatever. You know, they have their moment, right? It's like it's like going back to the '70s and the one-hit wonders. Mm-hmm. They're here and they're gone. You know, and then we get spoon-fed on major in major cities uh, by what the the amount of money can push and keep pushing right i look i am a fan of all music i think all music is great um i, I don't have to in and like it you know but i respect it mm-hmm. i don't care if you're justin timberlake or justin bieber man this is a hard business mm-hmm. and uh staying power is is not easy I think if we look at the Justin Bieber's of the world, it's like the Kardashians. It's kind of like it's pop culture. In the 70s, we called Justin Bieber David Cassidy. Right? <laughs> yeah, think sure. about it. David mm-hmm. Cassidy in the 70s was huge. Master, yeah. Huge. And every piece of you know uh, merchandise and everything. And of course, that lasted only a short amount of time because they didn't have the internet to keep it going. Mm. Right. So and then you had your leaf garrets and all this stuff. And as they they grew older, they just kind of went and they became a nostalgia act. Tiger Beat magazine. Right. So yeah. today your Justin Bieber's have much more lasting power, right? Because your fans now can grow old with him because of the click of a mouse. And you can just keep you know feeding the masses with a click of a mouse. And it's yeah. it's it's not that it's bad, it's great. Because I'm mm-hmm. sure David Cassidy would have had the same staying power if if you know you had that uh, you know information and that uh, and all that technology at the time. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think so going back to your thing about it being maybe kind of being down lower the underground, there is a glimmer of hope because like I worked with a lot of guys and I used to run a talent show when I was working and things. And seeing kids, younger kids, and I think School of Rock had a lot to do with this, with everybody like learning their mother's and father's favorite songs. And it was all kind of like classic rock. And at first I didn't think it was like, it was like, oh, come on, why are, we, why are you guys playing Smoke on the Water? But then you watch them develop over years. And Steve gets to do things with young bands from time to time. And you get to see younger and younger kids developing and they love rock they love hard rock they love metal they you know mm -hmm. and they're taking that and using that passion like all you have to do is look on instagram and you see all these kids like i saw young kids playing tool mm -hmm. like little kids playing tool mm -hmm. you know or playing rage against the machine just a kid and there's you know there's like this one little girl and she's like this big and the guitar is this big and she's playing all of these songs and they're not they're not and she's like, have to do this because she's so little. But it's that passion that's in the kid to do it. And mm. I think that's going to be that that wave is going to continue to roll. It might be it might be just a little ripple now, but I think it's always going to be a current. Mm -hmm. so always discovering Led Zeppelin. Yeah. Well, I, I think the the issue uh, is probably more so that a lot of kids aren't really picking up instruments like they once were. They're picking up the the turntable instead because it's easier. Um, you know, obviously that's that's what's all over all the social media is being a uh, a DJ, yeah. you know, star. Um, and it's also obviously easier for for the labels to control one person than to have to work through a whole band. Um, so I mean, that's something like when I was in Vegas, I you know, places where I used to see cover bands or just rock bands or whatever it was now it's just all replaced by edm you know djs and so forth but but i mean you guys obviously know you know with steve on the studio and so forth i mean i guess that's you know the other problem too is a lot not only a lot of these kids not picking up instruments you know they, they have a hard time playing with each other you know you gotta i mean we see all these great you know youtube stars and these virtual you know virtuosos all over the internet but a lot of them have a tough time playing in a band. You know, I think we've just seen a lot of the dissolution of the band now where even just to get, you know, two people in a room to, to create music is sometimes even a challenge <clears throat> itself. But I mean, do you see any of that with, with your, when you uh, work in your studio and recording any uh, younger bands at all, Steve? You know, I recorded this band recently from New Jersey uh, called Chemical X. They're between, I think, 17 and 19 years old. Okay. And I can tell you, you know, they remind me when I was a kid, they have this energy. And here's the, they're a punk band. Mm. But they're, what's great about them is that the, the punk rock that they're, uh, they're, they're trying to emulate is not like the newer stuff like that's been out the past 20 years. They're going back to the 80s. They're going back to the late 70s. That's these good. are like the UK punk bands that have influenced these kids, Black Flags and Circle Jerks. Mm -hmm. You know, that's hard. And they've got that dynamic. They've got that energy. And they're as a band, they're really together. And I've seen that, as Dan said, I'm seeing it more and more and more, which is a great thing. That's great. Yeah. It's just yeah. a matter of the the masses to allow that to come into your house or come over your speakers. You know, I think it's wonderful. I think it's great, you know, and it gives me energy because these kids are just taking it and they're running, you know, they're run, mm -hmm. running down the field and it's just, it's a, it's a breath of fresh air. It may be sounding a bit old to me, mm -hmm. but it's just has such energy and they have such, they have such passion for it that it really, really gives you hope of what's to come. Yeah. And the mass awesome. producing stuff that is always being, you know, programmed and something I, you know, I said, I, I worked with teenagers for, for almost two decades. Mm -hmm. And so you always hear what the latest thing is. And, you know, me being, you know, having the ears that I have and, and playing for so long, a lot of stuff was just, I'm like, like, I don't get it. I don't get it. But the kids now that are doing stuff like the people that Steve is working with and, and some guys that I had uh, helped trying to nurture up and stuff like that, it's that the popular culture, the mainstream stuff doesn't appeal to them. It doesn't touch them. And so they had to go looking for something else that sparked them. You know, when I hear some, you know, when you hear somebody playing, 
you know, songs from the, the 70s, classic rock from the 70s. And they're just like, oh, this is great. This is great. You know, and of course, playing those songs when they were hits when I was a teenager, you know, you're just kind of like, really? That's what you want to play? But mm -hmm. then you see them grow. You see them develop. And then they come up with their own songs and their own recordings. And they're going out and they're playing gigs and they're traveling around. And it's just that spark. It's that fire. But like I said, the pop stuff, they know it's mass produced. For them, it might be cookie cutter or whatever. Mm. And they like, that's not for me. I know what my dad liked. I like what my dad liked. But let me take that and put my interpretation on it and put my spin on it. And and they're coming out with some, some really good stuff. That's okay. That's great. You guys are giving me hope then. I'm, I'm very there's a, it. Yeah. There, there's a, there's a, a, another band, uh, a friend of ours, his daughter, she's 18. They're all, all the, they're all girl metal band. Okay. nice. And they're like, I don't want to say they're black metal because they're not, but it's interesting. Uh, <coughs> you know, I know the drummer, her, her idol is Chris Adler, you know, from mm -hmm. God. Mm -hmm. And they're 18 years old. And I saw them the other night and they, they kicked my ass. Now, again, do I love that type of music? Not particularly. I really appreciate it. You know, um, it's got the, you know, the oh, vocals, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, but they're 18 years old and they want to, you know, they believe in this so much and they're going to take it on the road and they're going to book their own tour and they're going to go to these little clubs around the country and play at kids backyard barbecues during the summer it's amazing right mm -hmm. and if you and if you you know uh out of like what's that berkeley up there where you had afi mm -hmm. is from right yeah yeah AFI, sure. they built their audience on backyard barbecues mm -hmm. yeah you know so mm -hmm. and they just played the um the, the la forum the other night yeah. so mm -hmm. you, you know and they've had a lot of success over the past 20 years but you know, you, you um, it starts with that passion and that drive. And I don't I don't care if it's metal, rock or whatever, you know, uh, punk. It's you know, you need that energy. You need that drive, that conviction. And I think they're just there's so much out there. There's so much hope, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and 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 basically, you know, it's kind of the the the, uh, the waiting album is uh, there's everything in one in there there's no there's no dark metal in there but you never know what we could come up with on the next one you don't know mm -hmm. you don't know well speaking of that i mean what's what's now the plan um are you guys um is there any reason or do you see you guys ever play in a, a show or a festival or is it just to continue to maybe <clears throat> no nope. we, uh, we are uh, we are uh just about done with putting the band together Oh, okay. Very nice. We'll start rehearsals, and I've got an agent already looking to book a shows. Uh, so we're, you know, we're excited about that. And Wednesday we start filming another video, so that'll okay. be cool for the song Blackout. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're really looking forward to that, and just keep the momentum going. Fantastic. And Fantastic. playing live, of course, is is. The best part of the whole thing right yeah. so mm -hmm. so we're we're uh, we'll be coming at you yeah that's Fantastic. the thing i love to do the best out of anything that i do or have done you know i just love playing and yeah. uh mm -hmm. to be able to go out there and then i'm i'm really encouraged that like our our expectations was just like we know what we did we like what we did since we like it so much we think that if people get a chance to hear it they'll like it and we've already gotten a lot of very good reviews and people telling us what these things mean to them, the feelings and emotions that they that are evoked from the music. And it's just like it's great that people get some sort of pleasure or some sort of reaction at it that they like it. And if we get a chance to take that out in front of live people and play to the best of our ability, I think, uh, you know, it's it's a great way to reach people and it's a great way to give people a release because of everything that's going on in the world, mm. what's better than going out, even if it's a local club, getting, you know, getting smacked in the face a little bit with some music and, you know, enjoying some time out with your friends. Those are the best ones. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. I absolutely agree. 
Real quick before we wrap it up, guys, Steve, just real quick, you know, you've got the studio there. I know um, I, you know, one of my favorite records uh, from last year uh, was recorded right there. My good buddy, Dave Incognito. I know you recorded the guys from Ign uh, Incognito Theory, The Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. Great record. Um, love that record. Like I said, the way, the way the sound came out was was just fantastic. Um, I, is this now something that you're you know really looking to do more of? Is the obviously the the studio work? Is that I mean how, how do you how do you balance that really between I guess your you know uh, your, your studio work and your musician? I'm I'm very selective students. of who I work with and. You know, I, I've known Dave for a, a while now and, you know, he, you know, he had some stuff and I'm like, all right, you know, let's, you know, I did the, e, I did the EP for them. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's got a great voice and the band was great. Uh, I brought in the punk band. There's a few others I bring in. I have my old band Morning Noise mm -hmm. from the 80s that, you know, we, we kind of reformed when uh, Cleopatra reissued all our old stuff and, it came it came out with a new EP. Uh, it it does two things for me. It because that and that and that band I play drums. It keeps my drum chops up, and I get to you know learn more with recording. And you, mm. it's a process that you learn different things all the time. And and oh, I never tried doing it this way. And, and you just you can take chances, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, but I like. I want to work with people that have that passion, have, you know, they want to do it. And it's not just that they're doing it just to have a demo or something to play for their friends. No, if no. I'm going to invest my time in it, I want to make sure that it's for the goodness of all parties, mm -hmm. you know, and it's not about a money thing. I, I, I don't really care about that. It's really about my passion for music my passion for the studio and definitely wanting to help others. You know, I think this is, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of potential out there as we spoke about, you know, the past mm -hmm. few minutes. And I think um, um, if I can help anybody, you know, I, I I'm here. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, especially in New Jersey, there's such great musicians that come into that state. I mean, I have said that for years, you know, I used to go over there, forget about New York, go to New Jersey. That's where the, that's where the musicians are at in those good solid rock bands yeah. all the time. Absolutely. Well, okay. Once again, guys, the band is to the listeners and viewers, black 29, the record is the waiting. It's out now on Cleopatra records. Hey guys, go ahead. Let the viewers and listeners know where they can go ahead and purchase the record and just kind of keep up with everything that you got going on with the band musically and all the studio stuff as well. You can go to CleopatraRecords.com. Uh, we're they're on all streaming platforms. Yeah, iMusic, iTunes, iTunes Spotify, Spotify, Amazon. It's it's all over the place. It's everywhere. Uh, take a listen. YouTube. The whole That's album's right. on YouTube. Oh, there you go. Okay. And uh, you know the album I know is is uh, it, they have it right now in different. I haven't even looked at this one, but they also comes in. Pretty colors. Very cool. Splatter and Beautiful. all kinds of fun stuff. Collector's vinyl. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> so there's nothing like vinyl, man. Nothing like it, you know. But uh yeah. yeah. So check us out. Fantastic. Here. All right. I'm sure I, I guarantee everyone will. Once again, everybody, Black 29, the waiting out on Cleopatra. And Dan, Steve, thank you guys again for coming on and good luck. I uh, hope to see you on the road soon. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you Matt. Matt. All right. Uh,